Okay, thank you everybody for coming and uh, thank you to be here uh, instead of looking at the Germany game. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a pleasure and uh, I'm glad. So today I will talk about our UFO, which is of course not a spaceship to explore exoplanets, but it's our unified framework for optimization, which has been devised together in collaboration with Katz Graber's lab within the QEO program. And it's a part of, uh, it's one of the many framework we are devising here at NASA to answer a very important question, which is how to probably benchmark early quantum devices. Indeed, we are in a very exciting moment just because there are so many quantum devices available and actually they, have, they, have an, uh, uh, they are large enough to run meaningful applications, a meaningful benchmark so we can finally understand if quantum computation can be worthy. However, there is a problem. How can we cross compare these quantum devices? How can we say that one device is better than another? And also, in the case of digital quantum computers, how can we verify that the answer that we are getting is the is expected answer? And finally, how can we say, how, we, how, can, how can we compare these devices with what we know about classical optimization? So today, I will focus on two of our main frameworks, which are UFO, which is mainly designed to look at optimization of classical cost functions. And also, in the, and the second one is the universal quantum computing framework, which is designed to, to mainly to look at the simulation of quantum devices in a more broad sense, both to um, simulate quantum circuits on the actual device or to verify what happens in the quantum device by, look, by classically simulating the quantum device. So let me start with the with UFO. So together with the Katz Grabbers lab, we have devised many algorithms. For example, one of them is the PT plus ICM algorithm, which is uh, um, which is an extension of the original Hoyader's paper, the original isoenergetic cluster move Hoyader, which has been properly optimized and designed for classical benchmark. We are also devising a non-ergodic version of this PT plus ICM that I will show you later. And also we have population annealing, hybrid cluster method, which, is, which has been used in this paper, uh, this one, yes. And uh, practically, it works by knowing in advance which are the clusters, so you can define the concept of clusters in your model. And then it's a kind of, uh, if you know, the, it's a kind of um, a cluster update where the clusters can only grow inside this cluster and then use metropolis sampling. But anyhow, this is not important right now. However, for each of these algorithms, we have a different code, which is written in a different way, using different languages, and every time we have to mm, fix a bug, we have to hard code it in every of this single code. There is no common framework. Every optimization must be done explicitly for every of this code, and therefore, it's prone to have even more bugs. That's the reason why we have started to design UFO. So the UFO, I want to say, I want to stress that UFO is not just another solver. It's not that, it's a framework. You can see it like a playground, like a way to just focus on what matters, algorithms. So you can forget about all the underlying things. You can just focus on how to optimize algorithms and, def and devise new algorithms. So UFO is written in C++17 using this modern standard, which allows high level of abstraction. And therefore, and this is the power to have uh, to create a new algorithm without knowing the underlying structure. And one important thing is that everything, so let me say, large part of the optimization is done in compile time, which means that if I decide to use a certain algorithm instead of another, 
that choice is done in compile time without overhead in runtime. And this is very powerful. And also, as I said, you can see this a playground in the sense that you can add a new algorithm without changing a line of the code, a line of the underlying code. And therefore, this is easy to maintain and extend. To give you a better idea, let me show you the blueprint of UFO. So every, everything starts with the definition of an Newtonian. As I said, everything is abstract. So I can say, I can decide to use a nicing problem, a pin spin, a cubo, pubo. And as I said, everything is decided in compal time. And then I can add my algorithm, which are just add-ons for this Hamiltonian. And then I can either have classical simulations or simulated quantum simulations. Since now everything is under the same hood, I can just use a single post process in order to analyze all the data. So regardless of the algorithm I'm choosing, I always have a consistent answer, and therefore, I can cross compare within these algorithms. To, better, to let you appreciate better the power of this framework, let me show you some case studies. One of the first case studies that I want to show you is our deceptive cluster loop. So this class of instances has been designed in order to be a hard benchmark for classical optimization. <laughs> and the deceptive idea is very, very simple. So one start with a logical problem, whatever it is. In this case, is the frustrated cluster loop that can be def which is defined in these two papers. If you want to look at the details, it's there. And then you embed this logical problem to, you minor embed this logical problem to another Hamiltonian which is in, this, in the case of this paper, which has been published, published on quantum science and technology as a letters, is the Chimera Hamiltonian. Now you have a tunable parameter, which is typically called JFER or JF in the literature, such that if this parameter is large enough, then the logical ground state of your original problem is mapped one to one to the ground state of your embedded Hamiltonian. However, we can play with this JFARO. In our case, we call it lambda, which is one over JFARO. And for this specific model, we can show that for lambda equal to one, the global Hamiltonian, so the embedded Hamiltonian, the ground state of embedded Hamiltonian correspond to the ground state of the logical problem. However, when lambda is very, very large, the underlying structure changes and now the ground state corresponds to a completely different logical problem that we can prove is a fully connected bipartite logical problem. So now the idea is, why don't we choose a lambda such that the ground state of the global Hamiltonian is neither the logical problem, of, so it's not neither the original logical problem nor this fully connected bipartite problem, so that we don't have any logical backdoor to solve very easily this problem. Because one of the problems is to design hard benchmarks for which there is no easy way to find the ground state. Here, there are the time to solution for different algorithms, so there is the D-Wave, the Hamzeh-Defreiter service code, and also the, the UFO module PTs plus ICM. There are two different, there are two different versions of the PT plus ICM. The L1 has also the knowledge about the logical ground state. And indeed, as you can see, for lambda small and lambda large, this PT plus ICM plus L goes very fast here, very fast here, but without, but in the middle, where the ground state is neither one or the other, is still, it's equivalent to not having any information about the two logical ground states, just because the ground state is a mix of the two. Interestingly, we have shown that the D-wave is faster than these algorithms to which we believe are the best known classical algorithm for this kind of problem, the DCL problem. However, we didn't see any scaling difference. 
However, we can say, we can say that the D wave for the first time has been shown to be fast in some senses, just an offset, but fast than the known classical algorithm. And also, it has been proved to be fast for a class of problem for which we don't have any logical backdoor. Of course, one can say that this was done by just considering the runtime and not, and, and not including the initialization time that can be very large. And indeed, for the D-Wave, the initialization time is large. It's about 144 microseconds. Here I'm showing the time to solution for the D-Wave by varying the annealing time, so the, the true annealing time of a machine, for how long I'm running the machine. And here I have a time to solution. Without considering the, the initialization time, the optimal annealing time is lower than one microsecond. Which means that if I simply optimize the time to solution in this way without considering the initialization time, the D wave is gonna be 150 times lower than before because I have to consider this number as well. But since if you look here, we have two order of magnitude the advantage from the D-Way will be completely flushed out. However, if we consider in the optimization also the annealing time, now the optimal annealing time is larger than one. And this is very interesting, and the reason is because if I don't consider the initialization time, I prefer to do very fast annealings, but with many repetitions, but now, I'm paying every time I have a repetition, and therefore, I prefer to have a slightly longer annealing, but in that case, I can reduce the number of repetitions. Here, I am plotting the slowdown, either not in, including, the, including the initialization time, but either by not optimizing the time to solution or by optimizing the time to solution, including the initialization time. As I said before, without optimization, it's 140 times slower. However, when I include the, when I, when the optimization includes the knowledge of initialization time, it's only 30 times slower, which means that, yes, the difference between PT plus ICM and the D-Wave is smaller, because now it's about of one order of magnitude instead of two. But still, this is the first time for which we can show that the D-Wave, a quantum annealer, can be, let me say, at least comparable, if not faster, even including the initialization time. So this gives hopes about quantum annealing. The second case study is the K-local interaction. K-local interactions are important because they appear, for example, if you want to use a quantum annealer to optimize prime factorization, there are for, both intera for, both for local interaction terms in that Hamiltonian. Also, it's very used in this all-to-all -all, um, architecture from Lechner, and uh, where there are only for local interaction terms. However, as far as I know, there are no optimized algorithms to run a problem with four local interactions. And the power of UFO is that you can just decide to use four local interactions instead of two local interactions, and everything is optimized in compile time. And, uh, and since everything is designed in, a, in, an in an abstracted way, I don't have to rewrite the code for PT plus ICM for four body interact for for, body, for local body interaction. I can just use my UFO framework, and everything is optimized in compile time for the four local interactions. And as one can see here, by embedding the two the two local DCL problem to a four local problem. Practically, the only difference is now that I have a constant overhead, which means that embedding these two local to a four local just give you a slightly worse, let me say, a con it's, only const it's only worse for a constant, which is impressive, which means that all the work has been done in compile time for the optimization, and therefore, 
the result is, a, is just a constant overhead. The third case that I want to show you is the 4D lattice. We know that this problem is typically very hard, just because since it, 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 uh, it is a four-dimension problem, cluster starts to be very big, which means that any cluster method, including PT plus ICM, is, lo is low, because you have to flip very large islands of spins. So we used our UFO framework to design a different algorithm to have a better performance for this specific problem. So here, I'm plotting the every point is an instance, and I'm using two different algorithms, either PT only, parallel tempering only, or I'm using their ergodic PT plus ICM. As one can see, using PT plus ICM is slightly faster, it's 13% faster, but you have a large overhead. One can think, well, why don't we cut the sides of the clusters? Maybe this help. This help, but now, since you have a cluster which is truncated, now it's not anymore isoenergetic, but it's non-ergodic. And now, yes, it's a little bit better. It's 17% faster, but actually it doesn't change much if you look here. So the two lines are the same. However, we can keep playing with UFO and see that if we both cut the energy, but also we look at the, if, you, if we cut the sides of the cluster, but also we keep under control the energy of this cluster, we have not only an algorithm which is 25% faster, but also it has a very good, uh, um, the offset is not so large. So this was a demonstration to show you that, and let me say that the, the sides of the code for this module, so the, for the PT plus ICM model, is about 20 lines of code. So which means that I was able to play with this, just modifying 20 lines of code, instead modifying a huge code. And this is then, um, this can be then used not only for rising, but all for all the possible choices that you can do using UFO. So this is the first part. So the second part is the universal quantum computing framework. And this framework has been designed because there is a huge fragmentation about quantum digital devices. There is the Google device with its own dialect for the, for the, to specify the quantum circuits. There is Rigetti, there is Intel, there is IBM. And every time you have to write an application, you have to encode this application for this specific language. And also, every architecture, every digital quantum device has a different architecture, which means that you have to compile the code for this specific architecture. So this is an internal project at NASA. And we wanted to create a framework for which you can just specify the problem, the machine, and everything is, as I like, as I, as I like to say, automatically compiled for the specific machine. And the interesting thing is that everything must be coherent so that I can cross compare everything. Here, there is the idea of a blueprint, and this work has been done in collaboration with Christopher Turbert at NASA. So the idea is that the user, as a user's environment, which is, it can be either very low level, like a generic GUI, but also it can be very targeted, like for example, I want to optimize our traffic management problems, something like that. So I specify the problem, and I can say, well, I want to, optim I want to optimize this ATM problem using QAUA for Google, and then I don't care what happens. This is fed to our server within a series of APIs. It is translated and compiled, and therefore, it is correctly sent to the specific machine. The interesting thing is that once the result is obtained, this is consistent regardless of the algorithm I'm using. For example, I want to optimize a specific classical cost function. I can do that using the D-Wave. 
I can do that using QAOA with one of these devices, but then I can also use a classical device. I mean, I can use a, a simulation for this. And the most important part is that in the end, all the results are gathered together and they are completely, let me say, um, there is a correspondence. Um, um, they are not different from each other so that you can cross compare between one or the other. And it allows you to better understand what's going on. However, uh, um, of course, one of the things is how can we access to all of these amazing services? So right now, in collaboration with uh, Katz Grabber's lab and within the QEO program, we are starting to launch this optimization zone. Actually, you can go here, but now it's just a mocking web page, but in the future we will have APIs. And the idea is to have all the services that we have under the same uh, series of APIs. And I want to mention the Pinacoteca which is an internal project in Texas AM, which is actually a service such that you can ask for tunable problems, it can be anything, and then the server gives you blindly in the sense that you don't know how these instances has been designed, but you can decide the hardness. So you can benchmark your own machine. And at a certain point, UFO will be available under the same optimization zone. And then you can, for example, download some instances and then run on the cloud UFO. And then you can compare the results with your own benchmarks. Um, for security reasons right now, this UQCF is behind NASA firewall, but we hope in the future to make it available. So I would like to thank, of course, my Quantum Artificial Intelligence Lab. I would like to, to thank you, my interns, uh, Andrea Di Gioacchino, who is working on uh, um, parameter settings, Benjamin Villalonga, who is working on simulations. I also want to thank you, thanks Chris Tubert, who is working on UQCF, and Chris and Braun, and we are working on simulation. I want also to thank the Cats Grabber and these guys at Texas AM. And we are looking for postdocs. So if you're interested in working with us as a postdoc, please send me an email. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Salvatore. Uh, I see two questions. Actually, three. Uh, thank you for the awesome talk. Oh, thank um, you. There's something on the lines of what we also do uh, at One Qubit. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I'm really interested to know is when you say uh, the problem goes to the different solvers and automatically solves it. One problem that we face is uh, different parameters that need to be chosen for different solvers. So is there anything uh, that you are you've done or are doing on that front? OK. Uh, thank you. Actually, that's a very important question. That's the reason why we have Andrea working on that, actually, because it's a very important question. And let me say that we are working on that. And perhaps eventually will appear under optimization zone, because I do believe it's an important task. And yeah, right now, we are just idle. Um, doing the optimization by hand, by looking at different parameters, we have a kind of automatization of that, but we want to go a little bit more in deep. But that's the reason why there is the other framework space, just because that's one of the framework we are working at. So um, I, that was, uh, thank you, that part answered the first half of the question I had. Um, when, and when you say, everything is globally optimized at compile time. I thought you were talking about optimizing the parameters for the specific uh, different input classes, but apparently not. That's still a thing that's done by hand. Is that correct? Yes, let me say that when I say everything, of course, it cannot be everything. 
It, it's just part. For example, let me tell you one of the things that it's done in compile time. We know that if you have a K local interaction terms, it's slower if you represent each term as an array instead of, for example, having different variables because the compiler cannot understand how to access that because it can be as a random access. So C17 allows you to have this expression fold that in compile time allow you to express everything as it were a single variable and therefore the compiler can immediately understand that there is no random access to that vector but it's a, a sequential access even if you are accessing in a different way and that is done in compile time. That's the reason why if you embed a two local and a four local you don't have a word scaling, you just have a constant offset because since everything is done in compile time you have, ju you have just to pay this small amount of uh, computational power. So, so you're optimizing basically for the, uh, whether it's a Cubo or whether it's a Kubo or whether it's Chimera basically. The, but let the me structure? say for example, PT plus ICM. We know for example that for two local Hamiltonians it's better do something. For three local Hamiltonians it's better do something else. Instead of having a bunch of switch which would slow down your code, we can use the new standard which allows you to use construct, const expressions that allow you in compile time to do that kind of optimization. So I want to say it's more general. And let me say, it's not that you cannot do optimization of the parameters in compile time. I'm just saying we, are, we haven't done that yet. But I'm saying you can do that if you want. Of course, it depends how, I mean, you can extend compile time as long as you want, uh, unless you, but what I'm saying is you can do whatever you want in compile time. Also, optimization of the parameters, but we are not doing that okay. right now. So, so my question is, um, how much of the optimization during compile time depends upon uh, knowing what the input is? Like, is it, can it only be one of the, the input classes that you have already available, for example, or can it, does it do other type, you know, how, how specific is it to the input? Okay, let me say that, uh, in my opinion, you are a little bit out of topic in the sense that uh, UFO is not about optimization of the parameter settings and optimization of uh, your instance. As I said, UFO is not another solver. It's a framework in the sense that if you want to design that, you can add very easily on UFO. What I'm saying is, you can do that if you want, and what I'm saying, it's extremely easy to do that on UFO. And eventually in the future, we will do that. Okay, to stay on time, I think we should uh, thank Salvatore again.